Hi, welcome to the optional extra video for the Smart for Two. When I first started making these car videos, they were like 10 minutes long and the Smart video now was 30 minutes long and this optional extra is going to be long as well. So <laughs> everything just seems to be expanding, but there's lots of interesting stuff that I find when I look at these uh, car histories and it's hard to fit it all in. So everything just keeps expanding anyway. The first thing I'd like to talk about is not the smart car, but actually the Swatch brand and what happened to Swatch because Swatch was actually quite an interesting story in itself. Um, there's a YouTube channel called Company Man and I actually sent an email to this to the guy that made those making those videos. He does videos about company history and I said, you should do Swatch, it's really interesting. So in the 1970s, switch watchmakers were mainly making traditional mechanical watches. That's what they'd been making for decades. They'd been making them throughout the Second World War and no one else was making watches during the Second World War. So they sort of monopolized the market and then they became the de facto place to get watches. And in fact, by 19, the 1960s, Switzerland had 50% of the watch market, but things started to change in the late 60s. In December 1969, Seiko came out with the first quartz watch. And then of course, in the late 70s and throughout the 70s, we got LED digital watches and then of course, LCD digital watches. And these were just taking over the market. They even gave it a phrase, it was the quartz crisis. It was, wasn't just digital uh, watches, it was also quartz watches that were just taking over the market. So Swiss watchmakers saw this whole quartz and digital thing as a bit of a fad and continued to make their mechanical movements. That led to two major companies going bankrupt in 1982 and that included the brands for Longines, if I'm saying that right, Omega and the Tissot brand. So the Japanese companies wanted to buy those companies originally, but really just for the brands. They didn't want the companies themselves because they saw them as outdated. They wanted those brand names, which of course were still worth quite a lot of money. But there was value in the companies beyond just the brand names. One of the firms had made the switch to quartz and had actually patented a way of making very thin watches. So the man that rescued both of these Swiss watch companies was a guy called Nicholas Hayek, who'd been a respected manufacturing consultant to many of the Swiss watch companies in the 1970s. He did a deal with the banks to take over both companies and to take them private. So being someone who rationalized companies, the first thing he did was rationalize the production process so that these companies were now using one third of the parts that they were using before to make watches. It was now obviously much cheaper to produce watches, but they realized that they could never compete with the Japanese companies on price. Japanese labor was far cheaper. So they used the uh, fact that they'd switched to quartz watches. This one company had already switched to quartz watches and that pattern for making extra thin watches, they decided to just go with that and run with it. And then of course, turn their watches into fashion items. So that's where the whole Swatch brand is created and they sort of issued this whole digital LCD craze, which by the mid eighties had had its, it had had a presence, but it had certainly gone down a lot from the late seventies, early eighties, where everyone was buying LCD watches because they were the latest craze. There's of course, the bit in um, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they talk about people are, eight men are pretty clever because they've managed to work it out to make digital watches. And it was, it really was the case. Digital watches were massive in the late seventies, early eighties, and everyone was buying them even as high end fashion things, which of course seems rather odd. Now people have moved to analog watches and things like that. Anyway, so they realized don't compete on price, compete as a fashion brand. And by having all these different fashionable watches, people would go out and buy several different ones. And indeed that of course came to happen. And some of them, uh, some of these designs from way back when, from the eighties and nineties can go for up to $20,000. Now these were originally $50 watches and because they were relatively rare now, people still have a big demand for some of these watches. So by the 1990s, Switzerland is back to over 50% market share. 
Anyway, moving on to the smart car story. The Swatch team, when they're originally starting to create this car, they approach Fiat, BMW, Renault, uh, General Motors, and Chrysler, and every single company said, no, we're not interested. Volkswagen, of course, agree to um, work with the, uh, the Swatch people, but even then they decide that it's not really the right way to go. They create their own fuel efficient city car, the 1999 Volkswagen Lupo 3L. 3L stands for the fact that it can do three liters per 100 kilometers, which is about 94 miles per gallon. On the combined cycle, it, if you do it at a steady 56 miles an hour, it gets even better fuel economy. And so they create a car that's very fuel efficient, but it's not so much compromised. It's a 61 horsepower engine, which is 45 kilowatts. That gives good acceleration, 14 and a half seconds, and a top speed of over 100 miles an hour. It's a regular car with four seats, but it's much more fuel efficient, of course. It has lower drag than the Smart City Coupe, 0.29 versus 0.34. So, in, in, if you look on paper, it's a much better car. It's more practical, it's, um, it's, it, it's a more fuel efficient car. And of course, it's a mass market car, which is you know, what Volkswagen want to do. They don't want to go for niche plays. They want to go for the mass market. And of course, in that sense, they were probably right to get rid of the whole smart deal and move into something else. But the Volkswagen Lupo, for all its cleverness for fuel efficiency, it doesn't have the character and charm and the fun image of the smart two-seater. So Nicholas Hayek's Swatch team butted heads with both Volkswagen and then when they joined with Mercedes, they ended up butting heads with them as well. Um, I think the problem was that before they did the agreement, obviously both sides weren't talking about what they wanted from the car, about the future of the car and the things that they found important. And the Swatch team failed to do this not just once, but twice. So they were obviously at fault that, you know, they were going to deals and not really realizing what they should be doing. I think the people from Swatch and particularly Nicholas Hayek were used to getting their own way. And so they just thought that they could do what they wanted. And it, essentially Volkswagen Mercedes would just provide the funding and also provide some of the car know-how, but they would provide the creative side of it. But the problem, one of the things I ne didn't really understand with Nicholas Hayek was when they were trying to create the, the, the smart brand and they were looking for the, the brand name, he wanted it to have the Swatch name in it in some way, but Mercedes owned 51% of the shares of the company. They wouldn't want to use the Swatch name in any way because they'd have to use that brand name in perpetuity and they would have to license it at maybe a heavy cost from the Swatch company. Why would they want to do that? They want to have complete control. So the Swatch founders wanted to have both hybrid and electric cars, but in the early 90s, they were, this was really impractical, particularly for German and Swiss companies that weren't investing a lot of money in that technology. Uh, they were still using lead acid batteries, which had a short range and were very heavy. They still didn't have the innovations in motor technology, which had come uh, by General Motors when they did work in the late 80s, early 90s to create some amazing um, innovations in motor technology that didn't need a gearbox. So when the team, the Swiss team, decide that they are kind of done with the whole Mercedes thing and they go off to make their own car, this thing called the Cree Sam, they, it only had 43 miles range. It was using lead acid batteries. It only had a 52 mile an hour top speed and nobody wanted that sort of thing. It was a tiny car with sort of, you know, two people behind them. No one, no one really wanted a car like this. So when the smart cars release, they produce all these different commercials, but I was going through the commercials. Most of them are very low quality. One of the problems I have with a lot of uh, car histories is you go back to the 50s and 60s and you can get really good quality at commercials and development videos and things like that because they're taken from film stock and then they've done a high quality transfer and you, the videos you get are quite good. And then you hit sort of the 80s and the 90s and even the 2000s where they've transferred these adverts from low quality videotape and they're just awful. So you get this period where things are terrible and then in the last 10 years, things start getting better because they're just digital transfers and everything's you know, 720p or better. 
but anyway, the, the, the commercials that they did in the 80s and 90s that are really low quality, sorry, in the 90s and 2000s that are really low quality, they just don't look very good. <laughs> and maybe that's why sales weren't doing very well. They didn't really do a good job of trying to sell their car. And if you compare that to the Mini and the Beetle, the marketing for those was very good. So by the late 1990s, Nicholas Hayek and all of the original Swatch team kind of had enough of the whole smart thing. They don't think the car company is going the right direction. It's sort of become a Mercedes project at this point. And if you look on Smart's website, pretty much all of the whole Swatch origin thing has just been pushed to one side. It's really all about Mercedes small car history. They talk about the NFAF, NF. NAFA concept in the 1980s and things like that. And the whole Swatch thing is just sort of pushed to one side. So then we get to the mid 2000s and Smart is um, trying to expand its range, particularly to get into the US market. And so they're producing the Smart for more SUV. And there were a couple of images which I found, but uh, there were several other images which I couldn't use because they were you know, on another website and they're not things I own but somebody discovered a whole load of the prototypes in a garage. And I'll provide a link in the description so you can go and take a look at those images because they're really quite fascinating, some of the things that they were trying to do from and actually show sort of real cars that were, going, that were very close to going in produ into production. And then of course, in the late 2000s, Smart eventually produce a hybrid, but they, it's, a, it's what they call a micro hybrid, which of course isn't a hybrid at all. It just does sort of start stop technology, which many companies were doing at the time, but they weren't the only company to try and use this whole micro hybrid brand name. Ford also did it with the Fiesta and part supplier Siemens VDO made the technology and were also using that same brand name. So then we get to the third generation car in 2014 and it makes sense for Smart to work with other companies to try and share development costs, Renault in this case. But it also made sense to merge the platform for the 4.2 and the 4.4. The 4.4 is really just a stretched version of the 4.2. This of course meant that the 4.2 could be a little wider, which is good if there's more elbow room in the car, but it also makes it slightly harder to park because it's a little bit wider. But it would have been tough to have uh, the 4.4 4 as such a narrow car because it's a four-seater. Both the uh, front seats and the rear seats would have to be offset, which would have been a very strange situation for a, a four-seat car. So with Smart making cars in France and Renault being a French company, you would have thought that the Twingo and the Smart 4.2 and 4.4 were all made in France. But actually the Twingo was made in Slovenia. so. That's confusing, but uh, I guess you know, that's what uh, Renault was starting to do. They were starting to take more production and take it outside of France for, for cost reasons. So moving the Smart brand to be purely electric was probably the right move, at least for Smart. They're a fairly small car company. The cars they use are for short commutes. It simplifies their production, so they only have to make one type of car, or certainly one type of drivetrain. It's also the way that things are going in the late um, 2010s and it would make the Smart brand stand out as being purely EV and Smart really needed to stand out because they were starting to become overlooked. But the Smart electric cars that they made only had like an 80 mile range and that's hard. Um, Nissan's Leaf had a similar range and people are moving to cars that have much larger EV ranges, 200 to 300 miles is becoming the norm now. Of course, in the late 2010s, they had the funky interior and then a few years later, they ditch it and only have a black interior. Maybe that's because no one was buying their funky interiors and we've all, maybe we all seem happy now with boring black interiors and white, black and silver cars. But at the end of the day, a car company just have to chase what people are, are buying. And so maybe that's why they decided just to go for a black interior. So one last thing, the Smartville factory, which has been making smart cars for years and years. Obviously on production now is all going to go to China and all, uh, all the cars are going to be made there. So that factory in France is now um, empty. It's been sold off to Ineos who are going to make their modern version of the Land Rover Defender, the Grenadier. 
So we'll see how that happens, whether that's going to be a success or not. Anyway, thanks for watching the optional extra video. Thanks for getting through all of this uh, content that I'm uh, producing. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.